Good afternoon, everybody, and apologies for interrupting your Sunday afternoon, but I wanted to say a few words about the truly historic achievement that was secured in Glasgow last night. And I'm very, very pleased to be joined by Alok Sharma, uh, my friend, the, the president of the, of the COP. For two weeks at COP26, politicians and negotiators and campaigners from around the world have been locked in talks about how we're going to keep our planet habitable for future generations by getting real about climate change. It was the biggest political gathering of any kind ever held in this country. And there was a reason for that. All these world leaders came to Glasgow because their politicians are telling them that they need to act. And we've heard about the peril that we fail, uh, that we face if we fail. And uh, we've heard from the individuals who are already living with the effects set up by real action from individual countries. For example, we've arranged a multi-billion pound partnership to help South Africa ditch coal and create new green jobs instead. On top of that, we've brokered a deal with the G20 to end international finance for coal by the end of next month. We've persuaded most of Western Europe and North America to mirror the commitment I made last December by pulling the plug on financial support for all overseas fossil fuel projects by this time next year. And when you add all that together, 90% of the world's economy is now following our lead here in the UK by committing to net zero, ending their contribution to climate change altogether. Don't forget that when Alloc took the reins of COP, it wasn't even a third who were committed to net zero. The developed world is finally going to hit the $100 billion climate finance target, or, 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 if, if only uh, a bit later than we would have liked. And over 130 countries have signed up to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. And between them, those countries are home to more than 90% of We've got trillions of pounds of private sectors lined up with climate goals. And we've even managed to do something that has eluded the world for six years by finalizing the Paris rulebook, allowing us to move from interminable debates about how to measure emissions and instead get on with cutting them. We can be immensely proud of what has been achieved by Alok Sharma and his team. I want to take this opportunity to thank him for his many months of tireless diplomacy and thank everyone involved in making COP26 a success, from the bobble-hatted volunteers to Peter Hill and his team in the COP unit. There he is. Uh, I know it's tempting to be cynical and to dismiss these types of summits as, as talking shops, but we came to COP with a call for real action on coal, cars, cash and trees, and real action is exactly what we've got. And just look at what it all means for our planet. Before Paris, the world was on course for a devastating four degrees warming by the end of this century. After Paris, remember, we were heading for three degrees. At Glasgow, we've turned that dial down to around two degrees increase. And of course, that's still far too high. But for all our disagreements, the world is undeniably heading in the right direction. Even the most pessimistic commentator will tell you that 1.5 degrees, that goal of restricting the growth in temperatures to 1.5 degrees, is still alive. Now the work continues to make that ambition a reality. Alloc is going to keep pushing, along with everybody else in the UK government, to strengthen the promises made in Glasgow and to make sure that they are delivered and not diluted. The UK government is going to get on with our own extraordinary record of decarbonisation, get on with delivering our green industrial revolution and exporting that revolution worldwide. There's still a long journey ahead of us and very little time to complete it. But COP26 has shown that we can do this. We can end our reliance on coal and fossil fuels. We can put the brakes on runaway climate change, and we can preserve 
our unique planet for generations to come. I want to finish by thanking once again the people of Glasgow uh, for uh, a spectacular summit and of course for I want to thank Police Scotland uh, as well for everything uh, that they did. And uh, now over to to you, to, to the media, for some questions. Damon Cromatica of BBC News. Um, Prime Minister, thank you very much. Um, first, for all its achievements uh, after this summit, it's the case, isn't it, that we are still on course for climate change and climate change at dangerous levels. And what's happened is, yes, there have been successes, but the ball has been passed to the next comet, next su summits, next COPs. Um, Mr Sharma, you were nearly in tears at the end of the uh, COP. You just allowed China and India to make final changes that watered things down. That really angered and disappointed the small island states, didn't it? Because it's left them still vulnerable and still threatened. And, and Prime Minister, just one supplementary. Uh, just over a week ago, you demanded that all Conservative MPs vote to delay any punishment for Owen Paterson while the, stat, while the system for governing MPs was looked into. But it's the case, isn't it, that Parliament has a commissioner for standards. She's looked into you as well. So can I ask you just very simply, do you have confidence in her, yes or no? And, and it's a simple question, because if you don't say yes, and you say, well, this has to be looked into, people will think no, that, no, thank, and well, you thank, don't like her in that job. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Damon. And, uh, look, I've, the, just quickly get the first, uh, or the, rather the last question out of the way first. The answer is, is, is yes, and uh, I think the Commissioner has a, a, a job to do and a huge amount of work to do, and, uh, and, and she needs to, to get on and, uh, and, and be allowed to, to do it. Now, on, on the, um, though, you know, whether the system is capable of improvement or not is a matter for the, for the, the Standards Committee and for the, for the House. But look, I mean, on your, on your, on your main... Uh, your main point. First time humanity is genuinely equipping ourselves with the equipment we need to halt anthropogenic climate change altogether. And so when you look at some of the, 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 the things we're, we're doing on coal, cars, cash and, and trees, you can see the, the individual commitments that we're, we're making. I think the, the Alec will speak about, uh, about coal, but it's an immense thing and about everything, but it's an immense thing to get a commitment from 190 countries to, to phase down or phase out coal. I don't know whether, whether the language is phase down or phase out. It doesn't seem to me, uh, as, a, as a speaker of, of English, to make that much difference. You're, you're, the, the direction of travel is, 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 is pretty much the same. You're, 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 and that's never been said before. Uh, on trees, you saw this enormous commitment uh, to protect the forests of the world, to halt uh, and reverse the loss of of forests by, by 2030. And on cars, uh, even on cars, which was actually very difficult, we got a third of the world's car market, a third of the world's car market, or, uh, from a standing start, because it had never been discussed before, to agree to go to electric vehicles by 2035. And every country made substantial commitments, gr substantial granular commitments to reduce carbon emissions. So. No, we haven't fixed it, but we have the, the tools. And the final thing that we, we, I think, got right at at COP26 was an idea that everybody basically gravitated around and, and towards. And that is using uh, development aid, state money, uh, our overseas budgets, the, the multilateral development banks' investments, using that to trigger private sector investment. And using that to drive the big de decarbonisation programmes in the countries that find it hard. And that, I think, was the big uh, intellectual breakthrough at this COP. That was the, the real change. So things like the, the programme uh, led by Cyril Ramaphosa in, in South Africa to decarbonise their, their power system. It's something we haven't seen before. And that offers real, real hope. Now, all of this is totally contingent on governments sticking to their pledges. But I, I feel something very strongly. I think that the, a, tippy, a, a tipping point has been reached in people's attitudes. And those leaders, 122 leaders, more than have ever come to any political event in this country before, those leaders are being galvanized and propelled by their electorates and the social power of people demanding change. And I think actually in, the, in, the, in, the, you know, in a very short space of time, 
it's going to be unacceptable to uh, start a new coal-fired power station around the world, and just in a matter of a few years, because of the of the of the of the global political and social pressure, and and you can see the the way uh, societies are able to affect that kind of change. So, I I I fully accept. I really fully and humbly accept that this is this is not the the full solution. Never could have been, but I think that uh, Alok and and his team, the whole UN negotiating team, have 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 delivered just about as much as we could as we could have hoped. And on getting language about coal into the into the conclusions into the uh, the cover decision at all uh, was was I think highly highly significant and a great achievement. But Alok. Great, thank you, Prime Minister. Well, I think the first thing I'd echo is that I, I do think this is actually a historic achievement. And we set out by saying we wanted to keep uh, 1.5 within reach. Uh, there were lots of people who doubted that, but we did do that. And it's not just the UK government saying that. You heard that from the floor from climate vulnerable countries. You've heard that from climate NGOs as well. So I, I do think this is historic. I think you, you raised this issue about um, you know, how do we ensure that people keep to their commitments. Well, we agreed the Paris rule book, and I know it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that is sort of fairly opaque for, for, for most people, but the reality is that it underpins the checks and balances on whether or not countries are going to be able to deliver on their commitments and whether they are indeed delivering their commitments. So uh, for the first time ever, we will be able to see that when a country makes a commitment and they report on what has happened in their economy, whether or not they have stuck to those. And in terms of first, so the Prime Minister, uh, of course, made the point that coal for the very first time has ended up in one of these agreements. I mean, I remember when I first raised this months ago, people told me this is never going to happen. You will never get coal in the language. We have got coal in the language. And I think the other thing that uh, uh, we have managed to do is, again, it's a first. We have got a commitment from every country to come back next year to look at their 2030 emission reduction targets. And we have got them to agree that they will look at those uh, to keep the Paris temperature goals uh, within reach. Uh, that's historic. We've also got that yeah, ministers hit this issue to see whether we are matching the commitments that uh, we've made. And we've also got agreement that for the first time ever, every year, there will be a report which sets out how countries are going forward with the, the commitments that they've made. I mean, I think those are all historic firsts. Um, in terms of the, the issue of coal, I mean, you asked me uh, about my being emotional. Well, look, I mean, the reason I said sorry, by the way, um, at, the, um, at the event was not because I thought that uh, we didn't have a historic achievement. It's because at the end, people felt the process was opaque. And we spent two years being totally transparent, totally inclusive. But what I was able to do was to take the text that was being put forward by those two countries, socialize it before taking it for um, you know, a, a formal uh, um, uh, agreement, socialize it with all the groups. And the reason we got this over the line is because people trusted the UK. They trusted that we were going to try and do something just to get this deal done. And I also want to make the point that if we had not managed to get this deal done, we would have ensured that all of those developing countries who need support, those countries in the front line of climate change, would not have got the support. Yeah. Right, they're getting more uh, funding to uh, adapt to the changing climate. Uh, we're ensuring that we're talking for the first time about issues like loss and damage, which really matter to them. None of this would have been possible if that deal had been lost. And I can tell you there was that one hour where I really felt that there was a, a, a chance that we were not going to get this deal over the line. Thanks very much, Alok. Um, Romilly Weeks, ITV. Uh, Prime Minister, before COP, you described the world as being at one minute to midnight. Where would you characterise us as being now? And uh, Mr Sharma, John Kerry told ITV News that he felt let down by the watering down of the language on coal. Do you think China and India have let down the world's most climate vulnerable countries? I th I, Romilly, I think it's still... Uh, very, very difficult. It's it's still a, a massive challenge for for humanity, as I as I've told you before, Romilly. I think that the the fatal mistake now coming out of COP26, which has unquestionably been a, a success, the fatal mistake now would be to think that we've in any way cracked this thing. You know, the nothing nothing could be more damaging to our attempts to defeat climate change 
uh, disastrous climate change than to suddenly to, to bathe ourselves in a warm glow of, uh, of self-satisfaction and think that, uh, you know, well, that's, that's climate change done, you know, it's on to the next thing. We're going to have to keep going. We're going to have to keep the countries that have made those commitments to their promises. And then we're get, uh, in, before 2030, uh, before 2025, we're going to have to extract some more. What we've done is keep alive that ambition of restricting uh, the, the growth in the temperatures of the planet. But if you ask me, am I more optimistic now? Yes, I'm much more optimistic because I genuinely think this thing is now propelled by a force that is bigger than corporations and is bigger than governments, and that is, propel and it, and that is uh, people and consumer choice and what citizens want around the world. And that fundamentally is going gonna, is gonna to make the difference. Um, sorry, Alan. Yeah, so no, I think on this, this point about the change of language uh, on, on, on coal, um, I think the first thing I would say, once again, is that actually this is the first time we have got language on coal in these sort of uh, agreements. Uh, that, that, it, that really is historic. And uh, yes, the phrase is now uh, uh, phase down rather than phase out. Uh, but that means that countries collectively have to reduce their use of coal. Uh, in terms of the reaction of uh, developing nations, I think you heard that actually uh, from the floor. And uh, Tina Stieg, for instance, who represents the Marshall Islands, talked about the fact that she was um, you know, bitterly hurt as a result of that change. I mean, these, these are countries on the front line of climate change. Uh, for them, you know, 1.5 uh, is you know, really very bad news two degrees is a death sentence. So of course it matters to them, and there was lots of emotion there. Um, and in terms of uh, you know, China and India, uh, I mean, you know, they will, on this particular issue, have to explain themselves to the developing countries. Yeah, by the way, one thing I would say is that it, 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 it wasn't just the, the negotiators. I think the, the stars of the, of, of the COP, for, for me, were so often those, those vulnerable island states and, and others who made such incredibly powerful arguments and, and were very, very hard to to ignore. Beth, Rigby Sky News. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister, um, you build this COP in September at Unger as, as a turning point for humanity. You said it was one minute to midnight to prevent climate catastrophe, and you said that we needed to act now. But instead, and I'm going to quote uh, the UN Secretary General, he said that the current plans for countries' plans to reduce emissions will still increase emissions this decade on a pathway that will clearly lead to well above, to temperatures rising well above two degrees by the end of the century. So I put it to you, isn't it a disservice to the climate catastrophe that we're facing to pretend anything but this COP summit fell short of what you wanted to achieve and what you've actually done is press pause and kick the can down the road till next year and Alex Sharma to you do you agree with the Prime Minister that phase out and phase down means the same thing because wasn't that the issue that actually that language is very different and that is uh, the controversy around it last night that upset you so much and then just if I may Prime Minister uh, the Chancellor said last week uh, that your government uh, needs to do better when it comes uh, to standards. Do you agree with him and do you think you made a mistake over Owen Paterson that you now regret? Thank you. Yeah, th okay, thanks, thanks Beth. On, um, I don't think Antonio would, uh, be, would want people to think, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the, of, of the UN, uh, that we've cracked it uh, here at, uh, at COP in in Edinburgh, of course not, and I totally agree with him about that. And uh, it's yes, you're you're right uh, that uh, we're still on a on a on a trajectory to uh, increase the temperature of our planet by around uh, around two degrees, as, as I as I said uh, at the beginning, uh, or that's what it that's what it looks like. Um, but what we have is the hope, as and I don't think uh, anybody would would dispute this. We have the hope that we can. Uh, use all the tools that we've now equipped ourselves with to keep it at 1.5 and to keep 1.5 alive and i think that was the 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 so what we've done at, at cop 26 is slow the is slow the growth we couldn't stop the growth uh but we we've unquestionably slowed it and um i think the, the other thing that's so exciting uh, and and makes me optimistic is i think genuinely that by uh, by asking for the for countries to focus on these very specific 
deliverables on coals, uh, coal, cars, uh, cash, uh, and, 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 and trees, and making them focus on what they're, they're going to do to reduce CO2. Uh, we've helped to, to plot the way ahead, to, to create a roadmap for, uh, for, for defeating climate change. And so uh, I am optimistic, but it just, it, it will, but I mean, I think, as again, optimism uh, should not uh, be confused with confidence. Nothing could be more fatal to this enterprise than any feeling that, uh, that we've beaten it or, or, or that we've cracked it. And on your other question, all I would say is, um, you know, I think it's very important that uh, all MPs work primarily for their, uh, and above all for their constituents, and that um, all anybody who lobbies for on behalf of a commercial interest is clearly in breach of the in breach of the rules. Well, you know, I think I think I th I, I you can you, you can you can take you can take for, from what I've said that I think all 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 MPs should. Um, should follow the rules, and I think the rules are there to uh, very, uh, protect them, protect the public. They're very simple to understand, and we should just we should go on with it. Um, Natasha Clark, the Sun. I, I just asked how Sean was oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yes, of course. Well, I, I mean, sorry. You phase down on the path to phasing out. Uh, and this is the first time we've actually got the coal language in. Uh, and you know, I think it's worth reminding uh, colleagues that actually. Um, COPs are staging posts. We've had 26 now, and each has built on the previous one. We're going to have the next one, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And I think the fact that we've got the coal language in means that at future COPs, we can push further on that particular issue. Um, you, you also raised this, this uh, thing about sort of, you know, I was emotional and, 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 and all the rest of it. Uh, I mean, actually, there's a range of reasons for that. Uh, one is because it was just relief that we had got this deal over the line. Now, I, I genuinely believe this is a, a historic thing that, that the UK government has uh, helped to pull off. Uh, and, um, you know, I'd had about um, six hours sleep in three days. Um, the Prime Minister uh, obviously has thanked, uh, you know, all the key people here. But actually, I also want to thank the civil society, the youth groups, they, of course, applied enormous pressure as well to ensure that we were able to get countries to make those commitments, uh, and they will continue to play, I think, a key role as we go forward and get better commitments from, from countries. And ju just you know, to, to reinforce that, whether it's phase down or, or phase out, the, the effect is that the, the, for the first time, uh, the world has made a commitment uh, to, you know, to, uh, for a downwards gradient, let me put it that way, uh, whether it's out or, or down, it's, it's downwards. Uh, and that's a, that's a first. And Greenpeace, uh, I think, said the era of Greenpeace. Uh, so, uh, I don't want, to, uh, don't want them now to Greenpeace now to repudiate this, but uh, Greenpeace said as, as a result of COP26, the era of coal uh, is ending. And, you know, that's a, that's a colossal thing. Uh, Natasha Clark from The Sun. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharma, now, now you've sealed this deal, are you going to be eyeing up another cabinet role, looking to hold ministers' feet to the fire, or such as uh, Secretary of State for Net Zero, perhaps? Um, you've also said you were disappointed for um, the last-minute changes to the deal. Do you feel like you have failed your children and grandchildren uh, in not pushing for more on coal? Uh, Prime Minister, do you think that you could have done more? Do you wish that you should have done more to, to help push